Welcome to the Hangar Z Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicast. In this long-anticipated two-part series, we have the opportunity to sit down with U.S. Army pilot CW5 Alan C. Mack, who authored the Riveny book titled Razor 03. In Razor 03, Alan shares his behind-the-scenes perspective of the horse soldiers in Phil into Afghanistan. He discusses the hunt for Osama bin Laden at Tora Bora and describes his shootdown during Operation Anaconda. Years later, he chased Bo Bergdahl, he rescued hostages in Iraq, and the lone survivor from the Kunar Valley. He lived by his unit's motto, Night Stalkers Don't Quit. Ten years of deployments brought Alan's monumental success and crushing sadness. Both provide intriguing accounts of war, love, determination, and emotional resilience. Join us as we discuss Alan's life and experiences as a special operations pilot for the U.S. Army, 160th Special Aviation Regiment, known as the Night Stalkers. Thank you to our sponsors, Becker Avionics, Metro Aviation, and Traca Systems. Cheers. Welcome to the Hangar Z Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts. The Hangar Z Podcast is the first and only podcast dedicated to promoting and exploring the personnel and equipment behind the missions in public safety aviation. Join your host, John Gray, Jeff Ratkovich, and Jack Shanley. So southbound, skidding to a stop, down by here. Looks like they're getting ready to bail. Heads up, guys, bailing. Okay, the guy, he's running through the house, jumping the fence, through the shotgun, threw something out. Grabbing the shotgun. Don't go over that fence. Don't go over that fence. Grab the shotgun again. He is armed. Stay there. Hold your position. Four on the stop. Good advising, Coach Four on the stop. Welcome to the Hangar Z Podcast. I'm your host, Jack Shanley. With me today is the creator of the Hangar Z Podcast, John Gray. How you doing, John? Hello, Jack. Doing awesome. Yeah, really excited for today's conversation. Me too. We've been talking about this. Yeah, back fresh from vacation and had the opportunity to, to read the book that our, our guest wrote over the course of my vacation, or at least finished it during that time. And man, what a good book. This is going to be a great conversation. Yeah, I'm excited. It's great. We're really looking forward to this. So let me do a little intro here to introduce our guest and, and start with this. I saw this week that New York City firefighter Bob Beckwith passed away. He was 91 and he died due to 9-11 related illnesses. Everyone listening to this, knows who Bob Beckwith is. They might not realize it. Mr. Beckwith was 69 years old on September 11th. He was retired from the fire department, but he responded to Ground Zero. And on September 15th, he was the firefighter standing on the top of that truck with President Bush. He helped President Bush get up onto that fire truck. And that's when President Bush at the megaphone was talking to everyone. And, you know, there's thousands of firefighters and first responders there. And at some point, somebody yells to him, we can't hear you. And President Bush said the famous line, I hear you, the whole world hears you, and the people who knocked down these buildings will hear all of us soon. Well, a month later, our enemies in Afghanistan heard the sound of an MH-47 Chinook entering Afghanistan with the horse soldiers on board. And that helicopter was piloted by our guest today, Alan Mack. Just amazing that uh, it happened so quickly probably much more quickly for our guest. That month probably flew by in a, in a second. So welcome to the Hangar Z podcast, Al. Uh, we are really, really honored to have you. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Now, we've been talking about this for, for a while. Uh, obviously, Calvin Dockery, he was on, a, a fellow Night Stalker. He s- suggested that we contact you and made that happen. And we're very grateful that you, you agreed to give us a little bit of your time to come on today. So with that, we'll kick right into gear and, and uh, start with a, a tradition that John has created through his through all the episodes of hot seat questions. No, nothing that's going to make you nervous. Oh my gosh! Uh, but uh, <laughs> but who knows? Maybe maybe it'll make me nervous. So John, uh, hot seat questions. Go for it, Al. As you know, the, the the hot seat is our our tradition here in the podcast. In the interest of time, I think I'll I'll just stick to one hot seat question, Jack. I think you have one yourself. I do. But I'll, I'll just do one. Uh, I'm really excited to hear your story. And man, it's going back on, on what Jack said. Uh, to have a great American like you on the podcast is it's an honor. Thank you for taking time out of your your day, literally your lunch hour, to, to join us. Um, so for the hot seat, this is a question that I asked my kids yesterday. They're standing at the doorway here in the office and <clears throat> going through some of the potential questions. And I asked my kids, I said, boys, would you rather be a kid your whole life or an adult for your whole life? Al, I'll, I'll be interested to hear your your answer before I tell you what my kids said. You know, I tell you, that's actually a tough question. Um, 
I, you know, because uh, being an adult, you get control of a lot of things. But as a kid, boy, there's just no responsibility and it's all fun. I, I think I'd rather be a kid. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people say, actually, I think it was Jeff that I first heard it from. He said, if you're a pilot, you're actually never an adult. You're always a kid. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, true. And a lot well, of have you ever that, seen, there's a, there's a thing I saw on, on Instagram, I think, you know, a little meme and it shows a little kid and he goes, mom, I want to be a pilot when I grow up. And she goes, no, dear, you can't do both. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That, that, that speaks it. to that. Yes. Yeah, so my, my kids are standing outside and they're thinking about the question. And, and one of my boys goes, well, if I become an adult, it means I have to pay taxes. I just want to be a kid. <laughs> he already knows about taxes. That's great. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I agree with you being a kid. No worries. You know, all the responsibilities that, that come with being an adult while they're great and you got to do cool stuff. Just think of being a kid and snow days. Today's a snow day for my boys. All I have to worry about is sledding and maybe a little bit of snow shoveling. So exactly. Pretty cool. Nice. Jack, how about you? Oh, I'm, I'm with both of you. Kid, absolutely, positively, as much adventure and fun as adulthood has been. And I've been very fortunate in that in that category. Being a kid, for the same reasons you said, the freedom, the mm-hmm. no, you know, just be home by this time, be home by dark. Uh, growing up in a small town in Pennsylvania, that it was, just, it was like that. I mean, yeah. they had no idea where you were. Yeah, uh, we were on our bicycles. Street lights are on. You got to go home. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's right. That's what happened. Well, that's that's my singular hot seat question. Al, thanks for for playing along. And Jack, I know you've got you've got one lined up as well. Yeah, I've got I've got one. I came up with it in the past twenty four hours because I was I just thinking back on all the stuff in your in your book and one of the things that just I mean it's a a minor thing in the world of, of this book and the content of this book. But I love that you, that you like uh, lines from movies that stick with you and yours was damn, we're in a tight spot yeah. because yeah. when that came up, I sat here <laughs> laughing because I love that line. I love that movie. Uh, and I thought, man, there's a lot of good lines in that movie. I mean, mm-hmm. is you is, or is you ain't, you know, <laughs> that, that, I, I just, it just makes me laugh. So I'm going to give you, a, I'm going to give you both a line from a movie that's that I say all the time in certain settings, and most people go, "What are you? What is that about?" But you never know. You might go, "Oh, that's from this." Especially since Al says he likes that sort of thing. So let's. Uh, I'm going to give you the line. Who wants an orange whip? Orange whip. Orange whip. Three orange whips. Mm. Anybody? Is that wow. uh, Matthew McConaughey? No, young one. John no. Candy. I'll give you that. It's John Candy, the late John Candy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. Um, Blues. I'm at a Blues loss brothers. There. Uh, Blues Brothers, when he's, sit, when he's sitting with those state, state troopers at the table, then they're waiting yeah. for the Blues Brothers, and he, orange whip, orange whip, three orange whips. I do that all the time, and <laughs> people just look at me like, what are, you, what are you talking about? And my other favorite, I'll give you one more real quick. All right. We deal in lead, friend. That's a good one for us to know, too. You, you, stumped, you stumped me, Ooh, Jack. I did. That's, uh, that's Steve McQueen in Magnificent Seven. Uh, so, oh, that's, that's anyway, a good one, yeah. too. No, yeah. I, yep, yeah, yeah. okay. Yep, Yule yep. Brenner and him are standing there talking to the the lead guy and telling him how the walls are built to keep him in. You know. Anyway, uh, I just thought I'd throw those out there, just kind of fun. But I love uh, "Damn, we're in a tight spot." And yeah, boy, yeah, Al, it's... you you got to use that line a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had a crew it's chief fun. named Everett too. You know, and they uh, in that movie, <laughs> you got Everett. You know, it's like oh, go for God. Everett. No <laughs> thanks. Everett, I found a whole little go for colony. <laughs> that's that's one of those movies that you tell people that you love it and people go that they, they either never saw it or they go that was a weird movie oh, i, I love that movie it was yeah. great it's we just, watched it different. over and over and over. we only oh. had so many vhs tapes and that was one of them exactly it's very unique it's a unique movie there's no doubt about it clooney is awesome in it yes I mean, yeah. uh, just the soggy bottom boys and yeah. oh, God. so after i read that segment in the book it was before vacation actually sat down with the boys and, and watched that. We'd seen it once before, or they had seen it once before, but we re- rewatched it just because I found that line in your book. It was That's a great line. It's a great it movie. Is. As is. a matter of fact, we had in the early days of Enduring Freedom, so we're talking uh, November, December time frame, where we had two teams, gold and silver, and gold was down in Bagram doing the initial stages of Tora Bora, and all they did was complain, and, and uh, we called them the Men of Constant Sorrow from that movie oh, that's perfect <laughs> and when we swapped out we were just we were glad to be away from k2 up in uzbekistan because we were away from the air force and we were just yeah. doing our thing and we were the bogram bottom boys oh perfect <laughs> oh my gosh wow you took it to a whole new level there uh, yeah, well you only had one movie to watch <laughs> that's great <laughs> 
Oh man. All right. So we got limited time. Here we go. We're going to, we're going to fly here, Al, and uh, do our best to learn as much about you and your, and your career as we can. So, but let's start with New Hampshire. You grew up in New Hampshire. Tell us a little bit about that. What led to enlisting? Uh, and uh, then we'll kick in. We'll go in from there. Yeah. Okay. So I uh, was born in Concord, New Hampshire. We moved to Maine for about a year or two and then back to Portsmouth, which is on the coast, you know, a whole 16 miles of coastline there for yeah. between Massachusetts and Maine. Uh, and that's not a straight line. That's all, you know, 16 miles of you know, co- coves and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we were talking earlier about being, you know, free range kids, you know, where you just went outside, you know, it's the seventies, right. And, uh, you know, you got in your 10 speed and you rode, you could be 20 miles away and your mother would have no idea. Uh, you just, as long as you're home by either dinner or when the streetlights come on. And that's how we did. We were just everywhere. And then, you know, of course, when my, uh, one of my closest friends, my best friend, uh, got his license first and, uh, you know, I was still, you know, 15 when he was 16 and we drove up all over the place, you know, mostly up into Maine, you know, just cause it was different. And, um, what got me into the army or interested was the be all you can be commercials of the early seventies. Right. Cause there was a couple of them that were helicopter driven. It was a guy, you know, high school to flight school. He's on a Cobra, you know, it's a, a W4 and this W1, right. A warrant officers. And, uh, you know, they, they whipping all over the place and they come in and the, you know, the senior guy pats the other guy on the back and said, not bad for a rookie, you know, like, ooh, ooh, be all that you can be. Right. And another one you get, you know, AT, it was really ATC, you know, air traffic control. And they're like, you know, you got a fog bound chopper and you're talking him in, you know, and he's doing a GCA on this Huey is coming in doing a PAR, uh, to minimums. And, uh, that, that got me. It was like, I want to do that. And the Vietnam war was just, was still going on. Right. Or maybe, and get my timelines back here, but I was interested in watching the evening news. You had the, um, you know, Hueys were always flying around, you know, at the five, six o'clock news, whatever it was. And, uh, how that didn't end until 75. Right. And then you, you had the volunteer militaries. That's probably when the be all you can be stuff came out. Uh, but I still served with guys who were draftees, you know, wow. and, you know they were now, wow. you know, senior NCOs and such, but, uh, they had been drafted into the military and they were now my, right. Uh, platoon sergeants. Well, the, the marketing worked. It worked on it Al. <laughs> and I think it I'll worked tell you on right a lot now, of people. People ask me now, you know, what's wrong with recruiting? Is it well, they're focusing on the wrong things. That whole be all exactly. you can be thing, you know, talked about what you could do. You know, I tell people all the time that ask me, it's like, well, you can either go in, get the college money, you know, no matter what you're doing, jump out of an airplane with your hair on fire and get it out of your system and go to school, or learn a trade. You know, be a plumber, an electrician, whatever it's going to be, you know, but do something. And, and always the goal is get out and use your GI Bill. You know, you can always come back in, you know, or you can stay in, but I, I don't think you join with that in mind, you know. Right. And and I think, you know, they tried to rejuvenate, the Army did, tried to rejuvenate that be all you can be with uh, a more modern version, but they focused on all the wrong stuff. They completely missed the mark, in my opinion. Absolutely. Yeah, I remember those commercials vividly. Uh, growing yeah. up in the same but that's era. what got me and that's what got me yeah well, that worked but then good <laughs> they, they need to get back to that they really yeah. do they really do i feel like the marine corps has done a good job today of of inspiring people to, to join the marine corps with their recruiting videos or commercials they're the the one branch that i look at and i'm like wow that, that's really inspiring and i agree with you Al. i think you know getting back to the basics of why folks are motivated to join is what inspires people well, that worked, and and you you graduated high school, and bam, you you enlisted, and oh, yeah. uh, off you go, and yeah. and you became a, a helicopter mechanic. Uh, what was, and nine years as a helicopter mechanic? Tell us about that experience. Yeah, you know, I enjoyed it tremendously, but you know, I went into the recruiter, keeping in mind that one commercial I talked about, where they had the W one and the Cobra. You know, high school to flight school was what they advertised, right? And so I go into the recruiter, I'm like, hey, I want to. I want to fly helicopters, high school to flight school, and you know, E6 sits back, pump the brakes turbo. <laughs> he goes, it doesn't work <laughs> that way. He goes, uh, you're unlikely to get in without some kind of, you know, special skills. You're not a pilot or anything. So why don't you join as an aircraft mechanic and, you know, learn the culture, get used to the Army, get Army aviation under your belt, you know, kind of thing, and then put in 
He goes, and it's much easier to get in. Now, that was a little bit of a recruiter shtick because he didn't get credit for officers, uh, but it was good advice. I mean, honestly, you know, I wouldn't have gone in and, and passed through flight school. It's the same reason I didn't go to college right away. I knew I would just party all the time. So uh, <laughs> that's kind of how I got in. So there I was um, as an aircraft mechanic, you know, Fort Eustis, Virginia. Uh, back then, the Army didn't have an aviation branch. You know, the aviation branch became the Air Force back in, I don't know, when it was 50s or whatever. So we were part of the Transportation Corps uh, in, in Army aviation. And so it had to be mm, 1983-ish, I think, where we became our own branch within the army and uh and nothing changed other than you put a different insignia on your lapel you know for the most part as far as like a guy like me was concerned but you know my first uh, tour was in uh, the republic of korea you know and the interesting thing with that when you talk about seeing the world and different things the president i think he was or or the leader of the military junta that ran south korea at the time was assassinated and so when I got there, there were on the street corners, you didn't have police officers, you had soldiers. And I came back, you know, 10 years later as an officer and there were police on the corners instead. And it was just such a different, it was interesting to watch essentially, you know, a dictatorship transition to a democracy. And I didn't have to watch the in-between stuff. I got to see, you know, one and the other. And it was pretty cool. And then, you know, I went back to to Texas, El Paso, and back then going to Mexico was was a, a you know fun thing to do. You know it wasn't dangerous, and we would just park and walk across. You know, hit the bars, restaurants, that kind of stuff. You know, I'm 19 years old, and uh, come back, and then I I ended up getting married to my first wife, my late wife, uh, Linda, and we went to Germany for uh, three and a half four years. Had my two kids there, and that's where I put in for flight school. Uh, and the plan was I would, so this is about nine years in, and my plan was that I would either get picked up for flight school and continue, or I would get out of the military and become an aircraft mechanic for Augusta, Boeing, any of the companies like that. And uh, I got picked up and, you know, the rest is history. And I did, you know, I did a total of 35 years, 11 months in the army. So, wow. It's a long that's- time. Yeah, well, that's that's, that's a good chunk of it is, is doing the, the maintenance side of things. So immediately when I saw that, and I, I did not know that until I, I read your book, that I immediately thought how valuable that was would be to not only becoming a pilot, but then dealing with emergencies and unusual circumstances and, and things with the aircraft. To, I, and I, um, I know you talked about it in the book a little bit. Expand on that a little bit, how the value of that maintenance knowledge. Thank you to our sponsor, Becker Avionics. Becker Avionics, new 3D spatial audio, will mitigate possible confusion in the cockpit by repeating the last 90 seconds of incoming messages broadcast over any two channels. Check out the new AMU 6500 at www.beckerusa.com. It was amazing to have because, you know, the TH-55, the little uh, little two-seat helicopter they used to teach everybody in, had just gone away, and the Army was using the UH-1 as their primary training platform. And I'd been working on Hueys for nine years, so Hueys and Cobras. So I had a good understanding of all of the systems and where things were located. And, and, and so when you're doing the thing with the instructor pilot, and he's, what's this? What's this? What's it do? You know, I knew what it looked like behind the scenes, what the what the gearing looked like, what the, you know, what the wiring looked like. So I was able to focus my studies on other aspects of the training, you know, aeromedical, aerodynamics, you know, so I could pay more attention. I could spend two hours on aerodynamics when my roommate could only do an hour because he had to do another hour on, you know, the hydraulic system or the, you know, transmission or the powertrain. So it was valuable in that respect. And that allowed to me become allowed me to become uh, the honor grad in my class of about 70, I don't know, we had 70, 73, 74 people in the class. And I probably wouldn't have done that, we've been able to do that if I didn't have that background. And then when it comes to actual missions, you know, the understanding of how systems function together 
you know, would help me during things, you know, uh, you know, battle damage, whether, you know, it's bullets or RPGs running through the aircraft or just a simple chip light, you know, knowing what's going to happen if I keep pushing it, you know. The reason I thought about it so much is because I am not mechanical at all. I do light bulbs and that's it. <laughs> I can't build anything. I can't fix anything. And luckily, my, my uh, stick buddy, Mark Williams, was my stick buddy going through training in L.A. And he was really mechanical. He's a car guy. He caught on to the electrical, the hydraulics, all the system stuff quickly. I mean, where he, he knew it inside out and he helped me. So that's why I was looking at going, oh, my God, nine years as a mechanic. I would have loved that in flight training. Yeah. And, uh, and then later in your book, it comes up over and over. And I really enjoyed it. And I mean, quite frankly, my time in the military, you know, it's funny because people will say, you know, hey, thank you for your service. And I think, I don't know what the good response to that is other than, well, thank you're welcome, you know, because uh, I enjoyed almost all of it, you know. And I mean, really, you know, the parts I didn't enjoy, well, they were very unpleasant, but it had to be 90% of it was just, but you know, what job and life, you know, is a hundred percent. There's, there's none. That exactly. I, I, I bring this, bring this up a lot. We'd be flying around the Southern California basin and I'd look at my partner. I'm like, Hey, we're getting paid right now to, to do this. How, how insane is that? And I know you experienced that same thing. You talk about some of the beauty of, of Afghanistan in your book. And I can only imagine some of the scenery you saw, you know, or you've seen over the course of your, of your travels. Because the 160th, when I was in the special operations, right, I did that 17 years, and all of our training was done in a real-world environment, meaning you, if you're going to do mountain training, you go out to, you know, Colorado. If you're going to do desert mountain, you know, we generally go to Albuquerque over water, you know, Virginia Beach, Houston. We'd come out to California. We did a lot of stuff out in L.A. back before our 4th Battalion uh, stood up. I'm sure my, our mutual friends Cal and, uh, and Dave probably told you, you know, we'd be out there at Los Alamitos, uh, there in Los Angeles, and uh, we go down to San Diego and and out to you know the islands and and stuff, and it was it was a lot of fun. Oh yeah, we d I did all my initial training and all my check rides were at Los Alamitos. I'm very familiar with Los Al. Uh, yeah, and you, whenever 160th came to town, that's where they were based. They throw you guys in a hangar and you'd stay for a week or two and have some fun, and get all our noise complaints. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's that, oh my god. They just increase. There's that place gets constant noise noise complaints. They just increased when you guys were in town. Yeah. <laughs> at, at what point during that nine years, and maybe it was the whole time. I, I don't know. That's what I'm curious about. Did you say, oh no, I'm I'm gonna I am gonna be, become a pilot? Was there was there an event? Was there a time period, or were you striving for that the whole time? What, what happened with that? Where where you applied the chief warrant for the warrant officer program? Well, I wanted it the whole time. You know, if you think about, you know, my initial goal was to become an aircraft mechanic for a while and uh, eventually work my way to flight school. So when I talked about, you know, at nine years, I decided because I was ETSing, right, the end of service. And it was like, well, do I get out or not? And the, the thing that what would have kept me is I was putting in for flight school. So I was in Germany at the time, West Germany. Uh, the wall was still up. And so this was 1988-ish, I guess, when I was starting to fill out the paperwork. And I put it in, and, and the goal was if I got picked up, I'd stay, and if not, I'd get out. And uh, that was it. I got picked up and uh, decided to stay. Wow. So you went through warrant officer, you got through that, and you went off to UCLA. And UCLA, this made me laugh, too, because I, I read it and went, huh? And this is not the UCLA Bruins in Westwood. What, tell us what UCLA is, Al, and, uh, and yeah. what your experience was there. <laughs> so that's actually an acronym for the upper corner of lower Alabama, right? So Fort Rucker, <laughs> you know, and it's out in the middle of the – there's nothing but peanut fields and cotton out there, and that's yeah. it. Like if you want to get a delicacy out there, it's uh, boiled peanuts, you know, yeah. which is <laughs> kind of mushy, you know. That, yeah. that made UCLA. me laugh extra because I, I spent some time in Alabama uh, – teaching and i was i was there one time with a friend jason woodruff and he took me to la barbecue one night oh. it's middle of nowhere out near gulf shores alabama and i go serious dude you're gonna take me to la barbecue and he goes lower alabama <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh i didn't know that so that really made me laugh extra when i read ucla i went 
upper corner, lower Alabama. I love that. And I love that <laughs> and so that's much. It, you know, it's funny because being stationed at Fort Rucker, because I also, not only did I go to flight school there, but I, uh, I came back at some point to be an instructor. And it's still, even when I was there as an instructor uh, in the early 90s, it was still just out in the middle of nowhere, rural. But you were still uh, 90 minutes away from Panama City Beach, you know, the Gulf Shore. Uh, so that was nice. And now it's all... I don't know if it's interstate, but it's, you know, four, uh, six lane highway. Cause you used to get stuck behind somebody, you know, you'd be driving down there, speed limits 55 and you get some guy doing 30 and we're going to eat some peanuts. <laughs> you know, and it's like, I just want to get my kids to the beach. Well, now it's, <laughs> now it's quick. So it's nice out uh, there. Th- and those beaches you just mentioned, they are beautiful. Oh, oh beautiful. yeah. You eventually ended up back there as an instructor. The topic of instruction comes up regularly. I'm, on our, on the podcast, being a flight instructor and then going back out and flying as a line pilot, talk about the benefits of that that uh, that you found from your perspective in the military. First of all, you know I was very junior going through as a, a chief warrant officer too, and I mentioned in the book that my instructor was an older guy, did not like younger guys, and he felt I wasn't didn't have an, I wasn't seasoned enough, right? So he just gave me hell the whole time. And I got to thank him for it, you know, in hindsight, because, you know, he taught me things about dealing with students that, you know, simple things like, you know, you pull an engine offline, you know, where to put your hand, you know, to, to make sure he doesn't make the wrong mistake. Because initially, you know, the engine needles are going to split and then you've got to decide to the rotor go low or to go high. You know, these are all, this is not a, a glass cockpit. This is all the old steam gauges. And so you've got to watch for that because sometimes the indications are the same, the change in engine noise, the split and torque, you know, and you've got to figure out, did you just go high or did you go low? And they'll either, you know, jerk up on the power or, or let it down. And, and he taught me, you know, where to slip my hand so they wouldn't see it or feel it, but I could stop or correct them easily. And that actually came into play later on, you know, just flying, doing missions. You know, the co-pilot might do something goofy because he misidentified a problem. And, you know, if I'm not actually on the controls, it was super simple to be, you know, near the controls, you know, when you needed to be and to know that. And it just, it was, it was fun to know. It was almost instinctual, I guess, because of that training, you know, when to, when to be paying attention, when not, you know, when you didn't have to. You talk about in the book, a situation where you're, you're the guy who's acting as PIC in your flight got spatial D and you took the controls over immediately, having not been a, a CFI. I think you may, might have been a little more reluctant to take the controls, but I think you know leaning on those experiences are huge. And then also, you know, f- feeding back into that the mechanics background, understanding everything that's happening on both the mechanics level and then as a CFI, man, that's 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 so huge. Yeah, you know, being an instrument examiner really helped me a lot because same kind of thing. You know, I because the way the army does instrument training, you know, is they start you out. I don't know, it's the first like six weeks or so, you sit in the right seat and you are the co-pilot and you are the evaluee for the senior guy, right? The, se- the guy who's already done your part. And he just moves to the left seat. Now, left seat, his job, so your job is to try to pass a check ride every single day, right? And you can't pass because the guy who just was sitting in your seat now has moved to the left seat and his job every day is to fail you every day, right? And uh, <laughs> it's hell. And then there's a, you know, there's a guy sitting in the back watching both of you and he can see, you know, and he'll fail the other guy if he doesn't make your life miserable. And th- because of that, you know, simple things, you know, back up your, your secondary instruments become so important, you know, where I think your average pilot may, may pay more attention just to the attitude indicator. And we've seen accidents where the, you know, the gyro went and, and there was a heck, there was an airliner that crashed, one of the smaller ones. They had three attitude indicators and the cockpit and all of them were showing something different. But when you see the cockpit video, like there was a camera in the cockpit, you can see the secondary instruments, you know, the turn and slip, you know, uh, the compass, you know, they're, they're whipping around like this, but the attitude indicator is going in the other direction. And it's like, you could pick out immediately which one to follow and then throw a switch and slave them together and you're back in the game, you know, but that kind of came from being a, 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 what they call an IE instrument examiner and an instructor. So you, you get used to setting up situations for people, you know, to simulate them. So when you see them for real, 
because you've been setting them up, it, you kind of know what it takes to make that situation bad, you know? So that was, that was good training. Yeah. And even when you're not at the controls and you're the one teaching or examining, you're, you're doing it. So you're getting all those hours of, of instrument training and, or whatever you're training and it just benefits you so much. I, I saw that come up again and again and again, where I was so thankful that I was in a position where I was doing a lot of training and it just made me so much better. In, instrument, I, I wasn't an instrument rated pilot, but when you, when you mentioned instrument, I, I thought immediately of, you know, being an instrument rated pilot and being current are two different things. And if you're, as the instructor, you're experiencing that over and over so that when you actually do it in real life on a real mission, it's going to seem like nothing to you where even an instrument rated pilot is going to be nervous. You know? Well, think about this, right? So uh, in the Chinooks that I flew in the special in the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, Echo models and golf models, they had a, you know, a flight management system. All the axes were coupled. So you could do a coupled ILS approach, for example, into an airfield to minimums, right? So probably 200 feet above the ground-ish. Get some newer stuff that take you, you know, lower, I believe. But, you know, you're coming in. You're, you know you're going right to decision height, and the aircraft is coupled. It's doing its thing, you know, and all of a sudden it starts to, to veer off, right? And you get guys who will just assume the flight management system and the flight director are going to do their thing. But because I was a, an examiner, and once again, I would do that to people, you know, all I had to do was just, you know, rest my foot on the, the left pedal, for example, and just apply a little pressure. And the automatic flight control system would detect that the pilot wants to do something different, right? Because the pilot always has the uh, advantage over the electronics. And so I push on that and it would disengage in that axis and it would do some, maybe it might, you know, uh, get out of trim. And if it gets out of trim, it doesn't hold the, the course as good, you know, and, and you can watch the pilot going, oh, what's going on here? You know, something's wrong. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, yeah, so it makes me an <laughs> asshole. But it's, it's, I probably saved somebody's life with that because I know that kind of stuff saved me a couple of times. No doubt. Oh, that's that's good. That's that's what instructors are there for. You know, the, it does come across maybe like that. My uh, my oldest son is a, a F-18 Wizzo in the Navy, right? A weapon system operator. So he's the backs here. He's Goose, right? In uh, Maverick. And when he was in flight school, he... Uh, He's probably, he'll listen to this podcast, but he, uh, he called me up. He said, dad, I'm, I don't know if I can do this. And he was in instruments and you know, the Navy, the one thing they really do well is they, they, their procedures are locked in, you know, and what they say and how they say it are locked in. So he had to, you know, cross a checkpoint and turn and he had things to say, you know, I mean, we all do, but they are very precise. And he called and he said, dad, my, my instructor is an absolute jackass. He is up my butt. And I'm like, look, who's going to give you a check ride? And he's like, well, you know, it'd be one of these other guys. They just swap students. And I said, what are they, what are they like? Oh, they're all cool. And I said, oh, you're not going to have any trouble with your eval. I said, you do it. I said, somebody, one of your buddies that has one of those cool guy IPs is going to get your guy. And they're going <laughs> to regret yeah. it. They're going to be getting a recheck two days later. And he was, that's yeah. what happened. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's funny. You could give him good advice, even from a different airframe, different branch. You just know yeah. how instructors are. <laughs> That's great. Because of our limited time, we're gonna we're gonna fly through some of this stuff. But so you were pilot for a short time in the in the Chinook, and Desert Shield came up pretty quick. Is that is that accurate? And tell us about the Je Desert Shield, Desert Storm uh, experience. Thank you to our sponsor, Metro Aviation. Metro Aviation, the world's largest family-owned air medical operator, offers comprehensive aircraft services with 140 plus aircraft in over 25 states. The Completions Center installs medical and law enforcement kits and avionics, serving diverse aviation needs, including offshore, utility, VIP, and corporate sectors. Yeah. So I graduated flight school in, let's see, February of 89. And then I had about a month in between that and the Chinook transition, which was, I think, eight weeks. And then I went on leave for 30 days, ended up in Savannah, Georgia, which was my new assignment, where I would be flying CH-47 Deltas. 
And right about the time I was in my, what they call commanders of Al progression, all that kind of stuff, uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And it wasn't shortly after that we uh, were alerted we were going to Saudi Arabia to participate in Desert Shield, right? Which is a defensive operation designed essentially to keep Saddam from deciding to invade the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So we put our aircraft on a, we flew up to Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, It landed in a, I don't know, a dock area near the ship. We went on some old fashioned ship. It wasn't even like a row row, you know, the roll on, roll off. It was, you know, they uh, took the blades off, you know, bubble wrapped it and then lifted it up to the top of the ship. And I actually rode over on this ship that did like six miles an hour, you know, the whole way over. So, uh, and I talk in the book about the flight up. It's my first cross country flight other than flight school, right? And in flight school, at least you're in the Fort Rucker area. And though there's nothing to look at, you know what you're looking at, you know, after a couple of flights. And here I am flying up the coast. I've got the Atlantic Ocean off to the right. I'm like, how could you not know where you are, right? And we're flying <laughs> chalk two behind a guy. And I'm just on the controls. And I've got this uh, older guy on my left seat. He's just talking to me about things to look for. And the, and the lead aircraft has a maintenance problem. He's got a chip, chip light in his uh, engine transmission. So he shuts off the engine, does a roll on landing to a nearby airfield. We follow him down, make sure he's okay. But we have to keep going because the other aircraft will follow in to, uh, to Wilmington and we've, we've got to get up there so they have time to um, tear down the aircraft and get it out of the way. So now there's a good time to train me, right? So now I'm not flying formation. He hands me the map. He's like, all right, Al, uh, get us there. You know, there's a line on the map, the whole deal. It should be no big deal. And I'm like, hey, how hard can it be? You know, I've done this before. And I'm like, all right, we're going to cross a set of power lines in five miles. He's like, all right. Another little power lines, power lines, they're everywhere, right? And finally, we're coming up on a big airfield. And he's like, what airfield is that? We got to tune up the frequency. I'm like, I don't know. You know, I'm turning the map like a the old bus, you know, driving the, <laughs> trying to make the map match the uh, the ground. And there's no GPS back then. It's a uh, clock and compass. And, uh, you know, he knew what it was the whole time. And finally he dials it up. And he's like, all right, I'll let you off the hook. He took the map and let me fly the rest of the way, <laughs> which is ironic that years later I end up as a flight lead, you know, in a special operations unit with a lot of responsibility, <laughs> you know. But uh, so we end up. You know, about a month later, getting to Saudi Arabia with the aircraft, and uh, we built them up. And as a young co-pilot, they flew me all the time. Like the senior guys did not want to fly in the desert, you know, because none of the tools we have today, you know, like, uh, you know, hover symbology or any of that kind of stuff uh, existed. So when you landed in the dust in a Chinook, it was a big, nasty brownout, you know, it was terrible. And uh, they didn't want to do it. So like, take, take the Woj you know, which is a uh, slang for a warrant officer, warrant officer, junior grade. That's me. I was, it was me and another guy. <laughs> and uh, they put us on every mission to include the night missions, you know? So especially the night missions, because they did not want, these guys just didn't want to fly, you know? And I, mean, I can see why some of them were Vietnam vets and they'd done their time, if you will. And I was going to get to earn my, earn my keep. And uh, so and th- that, that probably benefited you a lot later um, oh, yeah, as you yeah. went through your career as well. That that experience of having having to do that as a young forty seven pilot. Oh yeah, you know, and uh, all the dust landings. You know, I was the guy doing it, picking up sling loads in the dust. You know, you had to look straight down through the chin bubble. Uh, there was nothing to see out the windows. You know, you had to look straight down, and I was pretty good at it. You know, so like, oh, take, you know, take out, he'll, he'll be, he can do that. You know? <laughs> and so it was nice, you know, cause I, I did have, you know, a little natural talent, I guess, which was nice. So, you know, people want you to be your, their co-pilot is better than, oh, I don't want to take him. You know, he's not any good, you know? So it was fun. Uh, I mean, I really had a good time other than being away from my family. This was just a big seven month long exercise, you know, and then we transitioned into desert storm which uh, obviously was our mission was in the 18th Airborne Corps was to fly around to the west, the Schwarzkopf left hook, they called it. So they made the uh, the Iraqis think that we were going to invade Kuwait like a head-on assault or a uh, amphibious landing, right? And they kept faking it and uh, doing whatever they did to deceive them. In the meantime, we flew all the way around uh, out in the middle of nowhere and set up an operating base, FOB Cobra. We did that. That was a big, interesting situation. That's where the Apaches 
operated out of to uh, do what they call the highway of death. You know, that's where they uh, shot up all the Iraqis that were uh, in or leaving Kuwait. We did that in the daylight because back then, you know, the army still claims to own the night. You know, we're the army, we own the night, you know, and uh, we used to joke, nah, we're just leasing it because uh, there were there were aircraft running into sand dunes, you know, during Desert Shield because we were in Saudi Arabia, which had those great big, you know, sand dunes like you see in like Lawrence of Arabia. And those things don't just come up to a peak and come down. They come up, they level off, and they have a secondary peak. And in the dark with the goggles, especially at the time, PVS fives in the early sixes, uh, you could see the initial, the initial peak and you didn't see the extra bit. Right. And guys were just trying to skim the top and they'd rip their landing gear off. It was, it was a big challenge, you know, uh, now, you know, with some of the improvements in night vision goggles and, you know, nose, you know, flares, EOS, that kind of stuff, uh, radar, you know, you can see that stuff and it's a little different. We, we probably do on the night now. What was the primary mission that you were at that at Fob Cobra, what, what were you ready for? Was it pilot recovery? Was it uh, supplying? Was it moving troops? What, what, or was it all of the above? We were no, we were support. So we we're you know ash and trash, you know, and we were bringing in you know the initial wave. You know, we're bringing in artillery pieces and Humvees and ammunition and fuel. You know, we would fly in flights of five, and uh, with only a couple of minutes in between us, and we'd have five fuel blivets underneath each of us, right? So that's you know. 500 gallons in each one of those things. So it's a heavy load, about 18,000 pounds. And we drop those at the different uh, Ford arming and refueling points. And we bring in uh, 105 ammo and ammunition for the uh, and rockets for the Cobras and the Apaches. And the Cobras would essentially run up and down our ingress and egress routes and protect us. So if you had a precautionary landing or somebody engaged you, and it was out in the middle of nowhere, so it was more likely a precautionary landing. And uh, the Cobras would protect you and while the Apaches were doing the deep attack. And, uh, you know, that really was kind of it. I mean, it only lasted a hundred hours of shooting. And after that, we were responsible for picking up POWs. So we were flying around in Iraq, picking up POWs and flying them back to a, a prison in uh, Saudi Arabia, up near Rafah, up on the Iraqi uh, Saudi border. And then we were done. I'm going to assume something from John. John, when you read that part, the cop and you, when you read the part in, in Razor Zero Three, Al's book, about them loading up 50 prisoners of war in the back of the <laughs> Chinook, unhandcuffed, did, I, I know what you did, John. You went, oh, my gosh, because <laughs> that's what I did, Al. <laughs> that, that was, you know, to these two old cops, that was a stunning to us. <laughs> I had a, a Smith & Wesson 38, right? That's all I had. The, co- the, crew, chiefs, the crew chiefs had the same. And the door guns, which was M60s, right? So the, the MPs loaded them on there. Even there was a, most of these guys wanted to come. Like when we crossed into Saudi Arabia and, and we kind of told them, they're like, oh, Saudi, Saudi, you know, and they're all happy. It, you just saw the book there. I, I think I talk about my crew chief lighting a cigarette, right? Because you could smoke it on oh, the yeah. aircraft oh, back yeah. then. Yes. Was and and one of the prisoners like, you know, and so he, he gave him a cigarette and it got passed up. You know, up one side of the aircraft, down the other, and it came back to the crew chief. And it was like, you know, a little stub now. The the filter was like soggy saliva. You know, these guys probably, you know, they weren't well taken care of, you know, in their own army. And they probably had, you know, hepatitis or, you know, who knows what. And and it comes back to him. He, he grabs it and they're like, you know, and he's like, sir, uh, they want me to smoke a cigarette. <laughs> and it's nasty. <laughs> and we're like, they're not tied up. Just keep him happy, right? And he's like, all right, I'll take one for the team, you know? <laughs> wow. <laughs> and he did it. And uh, yeah. It's such a great story, right? Uh, so, John, did you feel, did you, when you oh, read yeah. that, did you do that? Okay. Yeah. Just the, so hair, I, the, hair, the hair in the back of the neck kind of stands up like, oh, man. But that's yeah, great. Yeah. Hey, now it's different know. now. I mean, when I was in the special operations oh, yeah. unit, you know, we got them strapped to the floor and, you know, oh, yeah. Flex Bags cuffs their heads and all kinds and, of stuff, man. <laughs> Well, again, we're going to fast forward and you eventually decide, I'm going to give this this uh, Special Operations Aviation Regiment a try. And you you uh, go to assessment and and get into green platoon and and you're on now you're on a 17 year ride with uh, the Night Stalkers. Just briefly tell us about, you know, getting into the Night Stalkers. What was 
you know, how did you decide that? And if there's something that really jumps out at you about that process that, that you want to share. Thanks to our sponsor, Tracka Systems. With over 25 years delivering groundbreaking searchlights, stabilized EOIR cameras, mission mapping and downlinking solutions. Tracka products improve situational clarity and coordination with ground crews, increasing mission safety and effectiveness. Visit trackasystems.com. See clearly, act decisively. Even though, you know, this was, uh, geez, what was this, 1994, I guess. Uh, the process is still the same for the most part. You know, I filled out an application, which back then it was all paper and, you know, stubby pencil, right? So the damn thing was like this thick and uh, with tiny font and everything from, you know, all right, here's 21 human traits or qualities, rate them in accordance with how you, you know, uh, courage, bravery, sense of humor, tact, you know, that kind of stuff. And you kind of look at it and it's like, these are all good qualities. I don't, I don't know. And so I found out later on when I was giving the assessments as an instructor or an evaluator, uh, that warrant officers all put tact as the last one. And the commission guys, you know, the majors, the colonels always like, you warrant officers always put tact as the last. I'm like, is it wrong? <laughs> and they're like, no, it's right. But um, so I filled all this stuff out. And when I, and I wasn't really sure I wanted to do this because I tell everybody all the time that Guys that I consider better than me were turned away, right? And you never know why because, you know, a guy will say, oh, they were assholes up there or they, they didn't like this or that. And then you find out later that, oh, he, he's been beating his wife and they figured that out or his finances are bad or his credit rating. I mean, all kinds of weird stuff. And it's not just your pilot skills that they're looking for. They're looking for, you know, the, the holistic approach. It's the whole man concept. You know, when I was giving the evals, I would say, uh, I can teach a guy to fly if he's got the aptitude, right? And you can tell that right away is can they, if I instruct him on a, in this glass cockpit, you know, here's how you do these things. Can he mimic me? If he can, I can train him. Now it's a matter of which much, what's harder to detect is what kind of person he is, right? Can I live with a guy in a tent for six months is my, my, like my mantra, right? That's harder to tell, right? And so you know, here I am, I go up, I do my assessment, right? It's a tryout, selection. It's about a week long, you know, starts out with PT test in the morning, uh, swim, general aviation knowledge test, which is a pain, a bunch of psychological testing, fill in the bubble, you know, like a 600 questions on a 300 question, I think. And then you sit down with a shrink and, and he interrogates you based on what they know of you. And then you get a a subject to give a class on that you have to do a presentation and you get a route, a flight route. They'll give you a target, which in the Tennessee, Kentucky area is usually a grass strip unlit out in the middle of nowhere. And it's like flying around that upper corner of lower Alabama. It's, a, it's very flat. There's a very few features and you have to stay away from anything like, you know, lines of communication, roads, big intersections, things like that. You got to stay away from it. So they, it's difficult to, to get a little intersection, you know, a little creek that shows up on a sectional, but that's from supposed to be from 10,000 feet and, and higher, right? So now you're at 300 feet. It's not necessarily as obvious. We used everything from uh, Ram McNally roadmaps to find bridges and, and all that kind of stuff to find something to use as a checkpoint. And it, you're doing it in a little bird, right? Uh, an MH6. And you train, well, in this case, you're doing the, uh, the, uh, the eval. Clock and compass, clock, uh, clock and compass, and map, and you got to make it to your target, the grass strip. Identify it, land plus or minus thirty seconds of the time. And each of the checkpoints, you have to cross over within two minutes and within a quarter mile. Right? Nobody ever passes the ride. You know, it's very subjective in nature in, a, in that sense. And I got to do mine in a, in a Chinook, in a MH forty seven Echo, which I'd never flown before. I'd flown a Delta. Very similar, but you know, this had a glass cockpit, a moving map, all this other stuff. And of course, in my multifunction displays, the MFDs, they blanked them out or they decluttered them. So I had a, I had a, an HSI, you know, a compass and an attitude indicator, and that was it, right? So I didn't have any of the other fancy tools. And we go out, and of course, I got lost, you know, doing the same, the bus driver thing with my map. And uh, <laughs> I saw this cluster of big antennas as we went by. This is all at night. And, uh, 
I say, oh, damn, those tar- those antennas are past my target. And the guy goes, you want to go back and, and find it? And I was like, no, I, you know, I obviously got lost, right? So we go back and he goes, all right, I'll give you, you can come on back tomorrow night if you want. I said, no. Nah. And he goes, all right, well, I've seen everything I need anyway. And then the next day you go in to a board in your dress uniform and you're sitting in front of a panel of officers, the instructor pilot, the shrink, the regimental commander, the battalion commander that might take you, the uh, S1, which is the uh, personnel guy and the instructor, obviously, that gave you the ride. And they run you through the ringer. And uh, what's interesting is the nicer they are to you, the more likely they're planning on just not taking you. You know, so if you, if you weren't a jerk in the, in the process, they're going to let you down easy. They're going to, you'll be there, you know, 30 minutes max and they'll just, you know, they might even tell you, come back later on, you know, but they're not going to be mean to you. Uh, if you've been a jackass or you're just a a prick the whole time, they're going to make you run through the whole process. They're going to make you miserable. They're going to make you cry if they can, you're going to sweat. And then they're going to tell you, we don't want you. You know, so don't, whatever you do, you go to these things, don't be a jerk, you know, you know, yeah. uh, and if they like you, chances are they're going to be pretty hard on you because they want to see, you know, where, where's your moral compass? Where's your cracking point? Right. You know, right. So you got to get through that thinking you're going to go through the thing thinking they're not going to take you. And then they kick you out of the room, they deliberate and they bring you back in, you know, 10, 15 minutes later. All right. You know, good job. We got you. And you're like, what? <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah, so it's it nothing's changed there that I know of anyway. Oh, that's that's intense. Jack, don't you have a story that was relayed to you by Cal on the selection process where when Al was was yeah, uh, on the board? I'm surprised. I'm surprised Al didn't say, "Well, the highlight of my whole career, <laughs> 35 years, eight, 11 months was giving a an evaluation to Calvin Dockery." <laughs> yes, the Red Bull. Yeah. <laughs> the Red Bull. <laughs> he uh he told me that story the other day, Al. He said he said, "Yeah, when I when I reminded Al later about that, he remembered a little bit about it. But uh, do, do you remember? What, I do. His I do because he and I, yeah, he and I have talked about it since. And it's funny because Cal, when he recounts the story, it's hilarious because he's very, yeah, it is. He's very animated, right? And he's like, it is. oh, I've got Al Mack as my instructor. He goes, <laughs> oh, you know, he's like a fanboy, right? And he's like, oh, yeah, Al's huh? very, yeah, Al's famous. Whoa, you know. And I'm walking in, I'm in a crappy mood. I just got back from overseas and a particular nasty deployment. And um, I didn't want to do assessments that that week. You know, like, oh, you got to do assessments. You're the only IP in town. I'm like, yeah. And uh, so I show up and Cal's already there in the simulator building. So we're starting out. Remember I talked about, you know, I'm going to talk a guy through, you know, pushing some buttons and, you know, making some things come alive in the system. And how would you use the hover symbology and the TF radar and maybe air refueling? And if he can mimic what I teach him, I know we can go further into the, the program. And I get there, and typically there's some table talk ahead of time, you know, an introduction, maybe some questioning, and tell him what I'm going to do. But he's not in the room. I'm like, that little bastard's late. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at my watch. I mean, the Night Stalkers are all about time. And uh-huh. finally, somebody came in and said, hey, Al, I think, you're, I think your student's up in the, in the box, right, in the simulator. So I was like, yeah, he better not be, right? So I walk into the bay, the simulator's up on motion. And uh, so I, you know, I grabbed the phone. I was like, hey, have you got Cal Dockery up there? And he's like, uh, the simulator guy's like, yeah, yeah, I'm just uh, giving him the right. I said, get down here, right? So they come off motion. <laughs> I climb up the ladder. It's like, you know, it's 20 feet in the air, this thing. I get up there and Cal's sitting in the left seat, which is where I'm supposed to be sitting. And uh, I'm like, what the are you doing? <laughs> and he's like, oh, you know, Joe here's just showing me the the simulator. I'm like, get the fuck out of my seat and get in the right seat or this ride's over right now, right? And Cal's like, uh-oh, you know? And he's like, oh. In his mind, he he thinks he's failed right now. And in my mind, I'm thinking he's failed right now, this little bastard. <laughs> so we get in there and I'm hard on him, you know? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm already being oh. a jerk. I mean, oh. I'm just not in the mood. And I go, you know what? Uh, take us to Afghanistan, right? So the database... He takes us off the cartoon database onto a real world, you know, like one meter imagery database, right? And you can see buildings built up 3D. And we, we, I took him to the U.S. Embassy in Kabul where I had helped recover. And uh, so I showed him how to land in, inside the walls, you know, with, with the dust and using the systems in the aircraft. 
and he did it really well. And he, he, um, considering he started off so bad, you know, I was like, all right, this guy's pretty good, you know? And then we're flying around doing a, a little traffic pattern. He goes, Oh, look, there's the hill with a bomb on it. And I'm like, hill with a bomb on it. And sure enough, there was a, a, a bomb. You could see it in the image, uh, on top of the hill. I go, so you were in Afghanistan? Like, cause we never had a chance to talk before we went in. So I didn't get to all that info. And he's like, yeah, I was with the 101st. I blah, blah, blah. And he goes on his whole thing. And I'm like, oh, okay. So now I start showing him some other things <laughs> and he's doing, he's doing the right thing. He's, he's, oh yeah, yeah. That's good. I mean, he's, he's letting me talk instead of, you know, the typical thing you do with an instructor, see if you can get him talking about things he likes, right. As <laughs> yeah. opposed to asking you questions. And Cal's, That's right. you know, Cal's doing that and I am this guy's great, you know? <laughs> and sure enough, I mean, Cal was one of my favorite pilots in the entire uh, regiment. I'm so glad that I got to assess him. But it's funny that many of the guys, even now, there's guys there that are very senior flight leads that were my students, you know? And I was I was pretty hard on them. I, I you know, I've made guys cry. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, I, I'm but, a little more old but school, it's rewarding. I guess. They, they no, made it, it and they became it flight leads. I mean, that's no. that feels good. I'm sure that feel, makes yeah, you very proud. Sure. You know? Well, Calvin, yeah. that's how he told it. I, he said, I resisted going into that cockpit with, with this other guy because I knew I he was an hour early, you know. I, and next thing you know, here comes Al and saying, you're <laughs> late. You're not where you're supposed to be. And he said, I thought, it, that's it. I am done. That was a waste yeah. of time. Yeah. <laughs> and he was well, so thankful that it turned around, you know. The, the funny part, at least how the story was relayed to me, was how adamant the, the civilian was that he'd be, he'd, you'd figure out where he was and it'd be all fine. Oh, yeah. And it was the opposite of that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and it I'm sure funny. he thought that, you know, I mean, me, you yeah, know, he did. Maybe, I mean, honestly, like I said, I was in a shitty mood. You know, I had just come back from <laughs> Afghanistan probably the night, uh, two nights before and got told I was doing assessments. I wanted to get my own personal things in order. And so if I had, had been in town, I'd have been, I mean, still been, I'd still been a dick, but I would have not given him, I mean, I almost threw him out as like, uh, yeah, yeah. Definitely. He said he resisted, you know, the, the guy that he, that he met with who he said he ended up being friends with real nice guy. Uh, and he said, he, he just kept saying, ah, Al will find us. It's fine. And Cal's like, nah, I'm supposed to be right here at this time. He goes, relax. And, and Cal says, I, I cracked, man. I, I cracked. And I said, I like, I trust this guy. He said, boy, oh boy. When Al came through that door, I I regretted cracking. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, because again, you know, we love the time you're giving us, but we're limited. So I, I'm going to pass ahead again. And sure. uh, September 11th, you know, September 11th comes around, and uh, this this the light switch goes on for not only your unit but for you personally, for a very active, incredibly dangerous situation tell us about september 11th and and within a in less than a month where you were next and what you were doing this is the end of part one of our conversation with alan mack stand by for a message after a word from our sponsors thank you to our sponsor becker avionics becker avionics new 3d spatial audio will mitigate possible confusion in the cockpit by repeating the last 90 seconds of incoming messages broadcast over any two channels Check out the new AMU 6500 at www.beckerusa.com. Thank you to our sponsor, Metro Aviation. Metro Aviation, the world's largest family-owned air medical operator, offers comprehensive aircraft services with 140-plus aircraft in over 25 states. The Completions Center installs medical and law enforcement kits and avionics, serving diverse aviation needs, including offshore, utility, VIP, and corporate sectors. Thanks to our sponsor, Traca Systems. With over 25 years delivering groundbreaking searchlights, stabilized EOIR cameras, mission mapping, and downlinking solutions, Traca products improve situational clarity and coordination with ground crews, increasing mission safety and effectiveness. Visit tracasystems.com. See clearly, act decisively. Thank you for supporting the sponsors who make these awesome conversations with people like Ellen Mack possible. Don't forget to join us for part two of this conversation on Thursday, May 2nd. I also want to remind you all to check out the amazing content that Vertical is producing and releasing on YouTube. 
The team of vertical photographers and videographers are literally traveling over the entire globe to showcase the good work being done by helicopter operators. Be sure to check it out on YouTube under Vertical Magazine. Cheers. Time to close up the hangar. Thanks for joining us on the Hangar Z podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts.